Sri Bhakti Vedanta Shami, Sila Prabhupada Ki My devotee actually becomes self-realized by my unlimited causeless mercy, and thus, when freed from all doubts, he steadily progresses towards his destined abode, which is directly under the protection of my spiritual energy of unadulterated bliss. That is the ultimate perfectional goal of the living entity. After giving up the present material body, the mystic devotee goes to that transcendental abode and never comes back. Report. <clears throat> Actual self-realization means becoming a pure devotee of the Lord. The existence of a devotee implies the function of devotion and the object of devotion. Self-realization ultimately means to understand the personality of Godhead and the living entities, to know the individual self and the reciprocal exchanges of loving service between the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the living entity is self-realization. This cannot be attained by the impersonalists or other transcendentalists. They cannot understand the science of devotional service. Devotional service is revealed to the pure devotee by the unlimited causeless mercy of the Lord. This is especially spoken of here by the Lord, Mat Prasadina, by my special grace. This is also confirmed in Bhagavad Gita. Only those who engage in devotional service with love and faith receive the necessary intelligence from the Supreme Personality of Godhead so that gradually and progressively they can advance to the abode of the Personality of Godhead. Nishayasa means the ultimate destination. Svasangstan indicates that the impersonalists have no particular place to stay. The impersonalists sacrifice their individuality so that the living spark can merge into the impersonal effulgence emanating from the transcendental body of the Lord. But the devotee has a specific abode. The planets rest in the sunshine, but the sunshine itself has no particular resting place. When one reaches a particular planet, then he has a resting place. The spiritual sky, which is known as Kaivalya, is simply blissful light on all sides. And it is under the protection of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. As stated in Bhagavad Gita, 1427, Brahmano hi pratishtaham, the impersonal Brahman effulgence, rests on the body of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In other words, the bodily effulgence of the Supreme Personality of God, it is Kaivalya, or impersonal Brahman. In that impersonal effulgence, there are spiritual planets, which are known as Vaikuntas, <coughs> chief of which is Krishna Loka. Some devotees are elevated to the Vaikuntha planets, and some are elevated to the planet Krishna Loka. According to the desire of the particular devotee, he is offered a particular abode, which is known as Svasangstan his desired destination. By the grace of the Lord, the self-realized devotee engaged in devotional service understands his destination even while in the material body. He therefore performs his devotional activities steadily without doubting and after quitting his material body, he at once reaches the destination for which he has prepared himself. After reaching that abode, he never comes back to this material world. The words lingad venir game, which are used here, mean after being freed from the two kinds of material bodies, gross and subtle. The subtle body is made of mind, intelligence, false ego, and contaminated consciousness. 
and the gross body is made of five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. When one is transferred to the spiritual world, he gives up both the subtle and gross bodies of this material world. He enters the spiritual sky. Those who wish to understand the conclusions of Srila Rupa Goswami, so they must understand the rasa, the truth of rasa. Mm -hmm. This is the final goal of the entire Vedic process. The prayojana. Rasagyan means knowledge of rasa, relationship with Krishna. Uh, tattva means in truth prayojana. Rasagyan. Tattva prayojana. So, prayojana means the goal, the final goal. Mm -hmm. So, what is this rasa? Chintmaya mm -hmm. ananda rasa. This is, uh, uh, Bhakti Nautaku is explaining that this rasa is not something material. Mm. When he uses the word chinmaya, it means it is a pure spirit. Mm. And then he says chinmaya ananda. So ananda means transcendental bliss. So chinmaya ananda rasa means that this. Rasa is translated as sweetness or sweet taste. So don't take this rasa to be like the material sense enjoyment. It is transcendental. <laughs> and because this Chinmayananda is supreme. Therefore, uh, Sarva Tattva Janra Bhasa. Therefore, all other truths, all other truths which are mentioned in the Vedas, they come underneath this rasa. Akanda Parama Tattva Dhan. This rasa is the eternal treasure. Mm -hmm. The paramatattva, the supreme truth. Mm -hmm. And all other truths mentioned in the Vedas are controlled by this supreme truth. and they are influenced by this truth. So, in this purport, Śrīla Prabhupāda uh, speaks of the impersonalists and the yogis. <coughs> so, they are aspiring to attain the truth, but they do not aim at the Supreme Truth. Yet still, they are influenced by it. Because also the karmis, the, the karmis, the materialists, they are also seeking after rasa, everyone. Mm -hmm. 
Rasa means the taste of real happiness. So, Bhaktivinoda Thakur explains, because of looking for that taste, the impersonalists, the jnanis, uh, anveshana, um, what do you say, brahmaloy anveshana, they uh, merge themselves into the brahma. Mm -hmm. And they do this by their process of uh, discrimination. Discriminating matter from spirit uh, by the intellect. Uh -huh. So this is a very uh, difficult process. Jnana uh, Yoga. So why are they going through such difficulty? Uh, because of a taste. There's a taste which is tempting them on. They are hoping to achieve ultimate happiness at the end. Mm -hmm. And the same with the mystic yogis. Uh, Bhaktivinoda Thakur says, all of what the mystic yogis are doing, their very rigid sense control and meditation. Mm. He says, Janra Chaya Matra Bari. It is just a shadow. Chaya Matra means this whole yoga process is taking place in the shadow of Bhakti Yoga. Mm -hmm. So, it is very, very difficult, even more difficult than Jnana Yoga, this mystic yoga. Mm -hmm. So, why are they attracted to it? Uh, again, because they're hoping for this rasa. Mm -hmm. And then Bhaktivinoda Thakur mentions the karmis, the ordinary fruitive workers. Uh, we don't think of the karmis as being uh, very discriminating, like the jnanis. We don't think of them as being very austere, like the mystic yogis. But their life is not easy either. <laughs> They're struggling very hard to grasp the objects of the senses and enjoy them. And they have to experience so much disappointment for this. Uh, one Mataji disciple of mine, Bulgarians know her, Kamalavati, she's in Belgium. So she just wrote me a letter uh, about her mother. So she's been corresponding with her mother. And her mother sent a letter in which she is saying, now at this stage of my life, she's old now. Now I understand everything is useless. I was for so many years working hard for my family. But uh, all this, my family life, these relationships, they've all turned out to be just a big disappointment. So now, I don't know what is the point of life. <laughs> uh, 
But then mother said at the end, but don't send me a letter about Krishna. <laughs> I don't want to hear about how Krishna is the answer to everything. <laughs> so this, uh, I told Kamalavati that this is just, uh, this position is called skepticism. No, skepticism is also another kind of philosophy. <laughs> where you don't believe in anything. But that is your belief. You see, this is the thing. You say there's no answer, but that's your answer. <laughs> you see. So anyway, uh, this is, yes, this is the end of the all the work and endeavor of the karmis. It just comes to disappointment. So, why are they undergoing so much trouble? For the same reason, they're looking for this rasa, this uh, sweet taste of full satisfaction. But we've just heard it nicely explained by Srila Prabhupada that uh, the Jnanis, the yogis, what to speak of the karmis. Actually, Prabhupada always says that jnanis and yogis, along with devotees, they can be counted as transcendentalists, but the karmis are just out of the race completely. They, we don't consider them at all. So, even the jnanis and yogis, uh, in spite of all their endeavor, they miss this, what Prabhupada calls here, nishreyasa, the ultimate destination. Mm -hmm. They're looking for this rasa. The taste for it, you see, is driving them on. Just like when one is very thirsty, has to have a drink of water, then this pushes him to somehow find something to drink. Ah, but some people may not find water. They may end up drinking gasoline or something else. Or instead of, yes, instead of boda, vodka. <laughs> so, so in this way they don't get the actual taste, the taste of water, which is Krishna. Your, your film had a lot about this in it, I saw. <laughs> taste of water anyway so yes yeah, so the everyone's looking for that but only the devotees can attain it mm -hmm. now on the other side on the side of bhakti yoga we should understand a few things When we say that the uh, jnanis who aspire uh, for the supreme truth by discrimination, but they do not get it because of, uh, quite frankly, because of no bhakti. But that does not mean, we should not conclude, that therefore within 
the bhakti process, there is no discrimination. Mm -hmm. Similarly, when we say the yogis, they miss rasa by their process of rigid sense control. That does not mean that there is no sense control in bhakti. And then when we say the karmis, by their work, they miss rasa. It doesn't mean, oh, therefore in bhakti there's no work. Sounds very nice. Srila <laughs> uh, uh, Prabhupada says there is a what is called a yoga ladder. Yeah. And uh, the different forms of yoga are like steps on this ladder. So bhakti yoga is the highest. Uh, so whatever uh, is featured in the previous yoga systems, they all come under bhakti. And what is the specialty of bhakti? The specialty of bhakti it is, is that it is the actual process by which one uh, can enter into one's loving relationship with the Supreme Absolute Truth, Sri Krishna. But discrimination is included in bhakti. Uh, but instead of just discriminating uh, my own thoughts, which is what the jnanis do, they just discriminate between their own, their own subjective um, perceptions and speculations. So instead of that, the devotee dis discriminates between Maya and Krishna. So there is discrimination in bhakti. Uh, we have to, at all times, in all places, in all circumstances, uh, see the difference between Krishna consciousness and material consciousness. Mm. We have to be able to logically understand what will be the result of my activities. If I do something in material consciousness, where will that lead me? And how that is different from doing something in Krishna consciousness. Mm. Hare Krishna. And similarly, in Bhakti Yoga, we must control our senses. Because sense control is the demonstration of devotion to Krishna. We are saying that it's devotion to Krishna that makes bhakti different, bhakti yoga different. Yes, so that's a fact. In a sangha yoga, they control the senses or they endeavor to control the senses without devotion to Krishna. So that's not very good. This is dry, uh, tasteless, frustrating. And simply leads to the inflation of pride. And 
and this combination of frustration and pride is very dangerous. <laughs> uh -huh. You see in the uh, Srimad Bhagavatam about this uh, great yogi Durvasa Muni. So he was very proud because he was a great yogi and he was also very angry, very easily angered by any little disturbance. Mm -hmm. So then he, out of enviousness to the great devotee Maharaj Ambarish, he committed a very serious offense. And the reaction of that offense was that he was chased all over the universe by the Sudarshan Chakra. He had to move with the full speed of his mystic power for one year. And that means at the speed of mind. If he would slow, slow up just a little bit, just for a little rest, immediately he would feel the heat of the Sudarshan on the back of his neck and he would have to again go full speed to stay ahead. So the sense control without devotion to Krishna, it is not advisable. Mm -hmm. No one can do it anyway. Because ultimately the senses, they belong to Krishna, not to us. And only he controls them. But again, the devotee controls his senses in devotion to Krishna. <laughs> Not that he doesn't control the senses. Because controlling the senses, oh, that is mystic yoga. We, we are not mystic yogis. <laughs> Rather, it is a proof that I am devoted to Krishna. Srila Prabhupada um, often would give the example of uh, the relationship between man and wife. So the man, the husband, is supposed to be devoted to his wife. But if she sees he's coming home very late every night and he has lipstick all over his <laughs> collar, and then when he comes in, he's speaking to her very sweetly, I love you, well, what does she think? <laughs> does he really love me? <laughs> Mm. She can understand what is the use of this statement, I love you, if he's out every night having relationships with other women. Mm -hmm. Yes, and also devotees work for Krishna. Mm -hmm. This is Krishna's direct instruction to his devotees. Yat karush, um, yat karoshi, tat karusha maratanam, he says in Bhagavad Gita. Yat karoshi means whatever you do. Karoshi is a form of the word karma. Uh, yat karoshi, uh, means a karoshi form of karma. Uh -huh. So, yat karoshi, whatever you do, tat karusha maratanam, you should do that for me. Krishna doesn't say, na karoshi, don't work. 
you can sleep. <laughs> you are my devotee, so you can just sleep <laughs> your whole life away. <laughs> No, he makes this very clear that you have to work. That is the law of nature. You can't avoid. So work for me. So then, if we do these three things, uh, use our discrimination for Krishna, if we control our senses for Krishna, and if we work for Krishna, then these three things add up And if someone is claiming to be a bhakta, a devotee, but he is not using his discrimination for Krishna, uh, does not control his senses for Krishna, and does not work for Krishna, then this claim is not to be accepted. And they will not attain the supreme goal. They will not attain this rasa. You see, Unfortunately, in this world of maya, world of illusion, uh, there is so much deception going on. Deception? You know, it's a form of the word deceive. Huh? Deception, anyone know? Yes. So, there are what Srila Prabhupada calls pseudo-devotees. Mm. Um, they are kind of ghostly representation of devotion to Krishna. Um, there is one story of Jagannath Das Babaji uh, and his uh, disciple who were traveling to Vrindavan. So they came to a particular forest which was very dark and overgrown. And Jagannath Das Babaji's servant uh, was on his way to collect from the forest some ingredients for cooking. But his Guru Maharaj warned him. He said, do not take food from any person you may happen to see in this forest. Because anyone that you may happen to see in this forest is not to be trusted. <laughs> this forest is full of ghosts and creatures like that. So the servant went out and he was looking here and there, picking uh, some plants and vegetables that he would find putting into a sack. And suddenly in one place he came upon a group of devotees. <laughs> <laughs> and they had tilak and they were nicely dressed. And they were just sitting out, they were sitting in a line and uh, some devotees were just setting out plates as if to serve a feast. Mm -hmm. 
And when they saw him, they said, Haribo Prabhu! <laughs> Just in time for Prasadam. <laughs> and they were all smiling and saying, Jai, come sit down. And then he, he, he said, I'm sorry, I can't stay. I'm collecting foodstuffs for my spiritual master. And they said, oh, why, why do you uh, look in the forest for, for plants and things like that when we have prasad right here? Just take this back to your Guru Maharaj. So they persuaded him. He, he was thinking, well, they're devotees, all right. So then they packed up his sack full of puris and halva, sweet rice. <laughs> and so with great jubilation, he hastened back to Srila Jagannath Das Babaji with a full sack. And with great excitement, he explained what happened. Guru Maharaj, I met devotees in this forest. And they were serving a very nice feast. So I brought this back for you. And Jagannath Das Babaji said, you take that bag away from me. <laughs> and he said, take it, take it away and just throw it out. Uh, so the servant was very astonished by this reaction of the spiritual master. But he was a good servant, so he didn't question his spiritual master's order. So he took the sack to some far corner and he dumped it out and what came out was stool. And then he could understand, just as his Guru Maharaj had said, these entities that looked like Vaishnavas were nothing but ghosts and hobgoblins, evil spirits. Mm. So a ghost is a creature, an entity, which is stuck on the, what is the so-called astral, or we would just say mental platform of existence. Mm -hmm. And similarly, Prahlad Maharaj has said that all materialistic human beings are fixed on that platform. Uh, because we have heard in this purport, Srila Prabhupada has explained what is the mind. So, the mind is the, uh, formed out of contaminated consciousness. The subtle body is uh, the place in which the living entity makes his plans for sense gratification. The senses are feeding into the mind all the information of the sense objects. And then the mind speculates on this information that I can enjoy this, I can enjoy that. <laughs> so, therefore, the mind is very contaminated. Mm -hmm. So, Prahlad Maharaj says, has said, uh, Manto, sorry, Mano 
ratana sati dhavato bahi that the business of the materialist is to ride on this he's compared the mind to a chariot so all they do is just ride in the chariot of the mind through the material world just looking and making plans and <laughs> contemplating different kinds of sense enjoyment And because this is how they use their mind, there is no question of uh, remembering Krishna. Their consciousness is being wasted in Maya. Mm. So, uh, there are some of these living entities who, uh, while contemplating sense gratification, and making plans, they understand that actually a nice way to get sense gratification is to dress up like a devotee. <laughs> because people will respect you and uh, thinking that you're a sadhu, they will give you donations, and they will even give you a free place to live, thinking that you're a holy man or holy woman, so they will give you nice bhajan kutir. <laughs> and they will come very humbly to you and ask you to give them instruction. And you can say whatever you want and they will believe you. Mm-hmm. And then in order to get your mercy, so to speak, <laughs> they will execute your order. Mm-hmm. So, yes. Uh, and in the Kali Yuga, this tendency of ordinary materialistic living entities to imitate the sadhus, the devotees, is very strong. Mm. Practically, this is what we mean when we say mundane religion. Mundane religion means here is a religion which uh, was started by a great personality, but now the representatives of that personality, they're actually ghosts dressed up in the cloth of a sadhu, of a priest, or whatever. But actually they're ghosts. See, a ghost floats through the subtle realm. Also, he's a, he's he's viewing the embodied living entities, and he's looking for some opportunity to enter someone's body or to enter some house and stay there. And all he does is make a disturbance. Mm. And this is what is going on in the name of religion today. It has become a big disturbance to actual spiritual progress. Because these religions have become haunted by ghostly materialistic 
entities. Mm -hmm. Just like those ghosts who appeared to be devotees and who gave by their a mystic power, and they could make stool look like Puri and Halva. So similarly, the uh, ghostly sadhus and so-called devotees and so on, they make nonsense look like Krishna consciousness. So devotees become prominent. Mm. Then, the so-called bhakti is going on, but without discrimination, without sense control, and and without a work, without proper work for Krishna. <coughs> Rather, instead of work, easy life. Mm -hmm. These so-called sadhus, I've seen in India, they simply move from one tirtha to the next, one holy place to the next, and they beg. They just simply beg. They're going here to every pilgrim with their hand out, please give, please give. And after a couple hours, then they have enough money to go into the restaurant and have a nice meal. And so one sees them sitting together at the table, eating big pile of rice and dough and laughing and talking. <laughs> and then when they wash, they're finished, they wash their hands, and again they're on the street begging. <laughs> mm -hmm. So this is a program just to fill the belly. Mm -hmm. Uh, this is the the beasts are doing the same thing. They're looking here and there for food. So if you put uh, a saffron cloth on a cow or an ass or a buffalo, does that make him a sadhu? <laughs> huh? But unfortunately. In the Kali Yuga, people think like that. They just, this is actually one of the predictions about the Kali Yuga, that a person will be taken as a sadhu, as a saintly person, only by what is called uh, in Sanskrit, uh, the linganam, means the signs, the external signs, that they're wearing saffron cloth, they're wearing tilak, oh, then he is sadhu. But behavior is asadhu. <laughs> So the conclusion is, is that bhakti or devotion without yoga, without the means to connect to Krishna, is not bhakti. It will because it will not lead to rasa, rasa tattva, the true rasa. Just like those ghosts posed as devotees, they offered stool that was disguised by some mystic power to look, it was disguised to look like Prasada. The Lord's Prasadam is Rasa. 
And that's why everyone likes to take prasada. <laughs> uh, but stool, this is a different taste. <laughs> the pigs and the flies, they like that taste. And as I was saying the other night, <laughs> those gentlemen who like to go down into the <laughs> sewer and hide there, <laughs> they like that taste. <laughs> mm. But this is not the taste of Krishna consciousness. <laughs> this is not the rasa that the Vaishn- the great Vaishnavas like Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur are telling us is the prayojana, the ultimate goal. <laughs> this is the not this is not the rasa we are meant to know in Krishna consciousness. Mm-hmm. So we want Bhakti yoga, devotion in yoga. Uh, devotion which manifests through discrimination. Differentiating between Maya and Krishna. Devotion that manifests through sense control. Uh, following the four regulative principles. <coughs> a devotion that manifests through uh, dedicating all of one's work to Krishna. Mm. And this will bring us to the real rasa, the rasa tattva. Mm-hmm. So, uh, this is what Bhaktivinoda Thakur means by Rupa Nuga, following in the footsteps of Srila Rupa Goswami. Prabhupada said the pseudo Vaishnavas, they imitate Rupa Goswami. They dress in this white Babaji cloth. Mm. And they take it that Rupa Goswami was not working hard. He was just sitting somewhere thinking of Krishna. Mm-hmm. And so in this way they try to imitate Rupa Goswami, but they are always unsuccessful. Huh. And so many scandalous stories come out from this type of imitation. So, in fact, Srila Rupa Goswami and the other Goswamis of Vrindavan were so busy in Krishna consciousness, as Prabhupada said, they hardly could find time to take a little rest, half an hour, and could hardly find time to take a little food stuff. Prabhupada said sometimes they just get a little, like, palm full of buttermilk in a day. There is that prayer. Sri Chaitanya Manubhishtam Shtapitam Jena Bhutale Svayam Rupakada Madhyam. So this prayer is saying that Lord Chaitanya had a desire. Sri Chaitanya Manubhishtam. He had a desire in his mind. Uh, and that desire was that Krishna consciousness 
Shtapitam jena butale. Butale, you may know, means this world. Shtapita means to establish. So his desire was that the Krishna consciousness movement be well established in this world. And therefore, Svayam Rupa Kadama Dhyam Dadati Sva Padantikam. Therefore, we offer our respectful obeisances unto Srila Rupa Goswami because he uh, fulfilled this desire of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Mm. By providing the world with so many authorized uh, scientific uh, explanations of Krishna consciousness in the form of his many, many books. Mm -hmm. So, this Srila Rupa Goswami, Sanatan Goswami, Jiva Goswami, uh, Gopal Bhatta Goswami, Raghunath Das and Raghunath Bhatta Goswami, the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, uh, by their scholarship, by their pure devotion, by their uh, most wonderful example, they established uh, this movement uh, in India and on their order, Lord Chaitanya, uh, actually, Shilo, uh, sorry, Srila Prabhupada, but on the order of Rupa Goswami, Srila Prabhupada said, he has his, he, those rooms at Radha Dhammara Temple uh, and this, uh, the kutir of Rupa Goswami is just in the courtyard. So Srila Prabhupada said he was directly inspired by Rupa Goswami because he was staying there in the years before he went to the West. So he was directly inspired by Rupa Goswami to carry this mission to the whole rest of the world. So this is rasa. <laughs> this rasa, as I said in the beginning, it is the supreme truth. And all other truths are under its control. Mm -hmm. So, whatever Shilo, wonderful things Srila Prabhupada accomplished, that was simply rasa, bringing everything else under its control. Srila Prabhupada established uh, bhakti, bhakti rasa, as supreme above all other philosophies, uh, above science, above all other religions. There's no doubt about it. No one can argue with this. Mm -hmm. that, is, that is the truth. This is tattva. When we can see clearly that bhakti is supreme over everything else, that is the tattva. And when bhakti, so-called, is mixed up in between so many other things, and it's hard, you, you cannot distinguish it. And this is the same thing, when the sadhus, they're dressed like sadhus, but smoking hashish. And then there's doubt, is this a sadhu or a hippie, or what is it? 
And how is bhakti, bhakti yoga, any different from uh, sense gratification? You see, when these things are not clearly established, then this is not rasa. This is not the supreme truth. Mm-hmm. So, this is the mission of ISKCON. Uh, actually, our, our mission is much more than just ourselves being devotees of some kind or other and chanting japa a little bit. And <laughs> Mm-hmm. and feeling some emotions. <laughs> Our mission is much more than that. Our mission uh, in this Rupanuga line is to establish bhakti, bhakti yoga as supreme, as the supreme truth over everything else. Therefore, our mission is specific and distinct. Uh, it cannot be compared with uh, uh, hazy mysticism and speculation, and you know where where they say maybe it's like this, but it could be like that. Our philosophy is not that all paths lead to the same goal. Mm-hmm. And that all beliefs are nice. And that whatever you do, it is for God. <laughs> no. Although this is very, of course, popular today. No. But it is to be rejected by the devotees with, in, with no hesitation. Srila Prabhupada said uh, Krishna's instructions in Bhagavad Gita are meant to reject all other philosophical positions, religious positions. It rejects them. When Krishna says Sarva Dharman Prichija, he's rejecting hey, all this, you know, all paths to one goal, all this all this nonsense Krishna is rejecting. For, for instance, the idea, Prabhupada pointed this out many times, the idea that is so prominent today, that it is good not to fight, it is good to be non-violent. That was Arjuna's proposition in the beginning of Gita. I will be a sadhu. (laughs) I will not fight. (laughs) And Krishna said, you nonsense. (laughs) Speaking learned words, but you're nothing but a fool. Uh So, Bhagavad Gita is teaching us to fight for Krishna. Uh, Fighting for Krishna means, you know, not fighting with blindfold like this. (laughs) But it means fighting to win with full power. Completely defeating all opposition. Establishing Krishna consciousness as the winner, the clear winner, having knocked out all opponents. They're all on the ground. 
Ale kończy. Mm-hmm. This is our mission. Mm-hmm. Our mission is not to live in harmony and togetherness with uh, the Shaivites and the and the Prakita Sahajiyas and the and the gross materialists and the atheists and just all looking at one another and smiling. You are nice. You are nice also. <laughs> I don't agree with you, but you are nice. <laughs> Mm-hmm. No, this means that you have not won the fight. This means you have given up. You have put out the white flag. Mm-hmm. You have compromised. And for this, there will be no rasa. Because rasa, rasa in Krishna consciousness is this is the this is the rasa tattva, the science of rasa that Rupa Goswami has taught. That in rasa there is no compromise with uh, uh, um, incompatible tastes. Mm-hmm. Because rasa actually is based on the principle of satisfying Lord Krishna. When one can satisfy Krishna, when one can render service that Krishna actually likes, then the storehouse, the treasure house of rasa opens up and it flows out and this taste of nectar becomes available. Mm. So this half-hearted type of devotional service, so-called devotional service, compromised devotional service, it does not satisfy Krishna. Mm-hmm. Krishna is God, and God is first class. Mm-hmm. Prabhupada said so many times, Krishna is first class. His his standard is the best. So if our aspiration is to serve Krishna, then we have to serve Krishna in that way. Of course, Krishna is not attached to nice arrangements. He is uh, Atmarama, he is self-satisfied. But first class service to Krishna means that one is trying with all of his power, with all of his intelligence, with all of his facility uh, to please the Lord. Here in Brokaloka, it is simply not possible to offer everything with the same standard, say, as in West Germany, but we can try, we should do our best. And this is what Krishna sees and accepts. Mm-hmm. But if one is thinking that, I don't know, I, actually it's hard to imagine what they think. <laughs> But it seems that they think that Krishna 
that, that somehow they, they have such a special relationship with Krishna already that they can more or less do whatever they want and Krishna is somehow obliged to accept it. But this is not a fact. Mm-hmm. So if uh, anyway, I think you've understood. <laughs> we have a mission to establish bhakti yoga as distinct and supreme from all other forms of religion, philosophy, uh, work, culture. Mm-hmm. And by doing this, this thick, sweet honey of rasa will flow. It will flow here from the lotus feet of Sri Sri Gornitai. It will flow down the altar. Mm. Also flowing from Sri Sad Buj. And it will spill on the ground and grow more and more and come up to our chests as we're chanting and dancing. Then up to our chins and finally over our heads and it will flow out the window and down the mountain (laughs) and it will flow into Sofia through the streets and people, their their cars will stop because it is so thick (laughs) and they will be trying to run away but they're slipping in the rasa and falling on their face and drinking it. (laughs) And it will get deeper and deeper and cover all the buildings. And this way everyone will drown in the rasa. (laughs) So this is actually the goal of the Krishna Consciousness Movement. (laughs) That everything will be flooded with the real rasa. Uh So then there's nothing left. (laughs) There's no other possible position. This is what we are here to do. Srila Prabhupada ki Jai! Srila Prabhupada Maharaj ki Jai! Hare Krishna.